All right. Well, I guess here we go again. I missed it thinking that I was over here, but we just had the American football Super Bowl uh, not long ago. And I gather there was a commercial um, where Bill Murray replayed, reprised kind of the role of Groundhog Day. It ended up being a commercial for Jeep, which is a little disappointing. But needless to say, if you're not familiar with the movie of Groundhog Day, it's where you wake up and every day is the same one over again. And this is exactly how I feel at this moment. <laughs> and probably you too. Um, but at least this one's a little bit different. I get to actually stand here the whole time since I'm not going to write things out. And so at least that distinguishes this talk from the other ones. Um, uh, yeah. So let's go ahead and get started. Like I said, I'd really, I, I think this is, this is an area that um, I've become particularly interested in, really look forward to getting feedback from different folks upon, because I think it's, it's a bit different than the average evolutionary biology talk, <laughs> notably the second word that's being used in the title. So a lot of the work that you know, everyone in this room either does or aspires to do, the work that I've done, you know, certainly falls under you know, the line of, of this, right? looking at how selection impacts all sorts of things, the physiology itself, the dynamics of the population, you know, fixation probabilities, whatever your favorite aspect of things are. And if anything, the person of today's talk could be seen as you know, like the antichrist of evolution. And I feel like that's, that's too strong of uh, a take on things. Um, you know, if you're not familiar with the Lamarckian sort of evolution, this is the idea that instead of genetic, because this was early 1800s, this was before, you know, even Darwin's was before genetics was understood, but this was the idea that instead of kind of inherited changes uh, from the organisms, it's kind of in inherited phenotypes. You know, if you work out, your children will be more muscular because you worked out. You know, if you've developed a like for, you know, a particular type of curry, your kids will too, you know, like, you, that you can just, you know, pass on these phenotypes. And so, you know, the, the, the image that's used is, you know, the giraffe that, you know, stretches its neck, et cetera. And so then its progeny are going to have a, a longer neck precisely because of, like, the actions, the phenotype of, of the generation before, and that, you know, this will lead to, to change. And so certainly, since it's stricto, that is not the case, right? It's not like the, the last universal common ancestor has simply behaved differently along the different lineages, and you're, you're, you're picking up the, the, the history of those phenotypes. Gene types have certainly been behind it. However, th there has been, of course, uh, plenty of, of Lamarckian sort of phenomena that we would fit under the, the title of epigenetics. Inherited, or at least for some timeline changes, that are not at the level of the actual genome AGCT, but something else, histones, methylation, regulatory systems, a number of things. And so I'm going to talk about that in, in, in the context of microbial evolution. Um, and so this, this leads to, the, to thinking about the idea that even identical genotypes can actually have potentially multiple phenotypes, all right? And this could take, you know, kind of all uh, shapes and magnitudes of things that are possible um, from, from, you know, relatively small to relatively larger examples. And so where does this come from? And so I, I tucked a few kind of lecture notes in, into this sort of thing. Why would two cells be different, right? Um, one of the major, it's not the only, but one of the major reasons is that some of these processes that we think of, uh, and, and we talk about there being a rate, like this promoter was on, you're making something. Okay, that's fine. Now you guys probably know enough to say, okay, even though there's some rate, those are discrete events. You're making, you know, transcript. But we think of that as, we talk about it as, it's, as if it was a consistent single process. But what actually goes on in cells is something that looks more like this. These would be like mRNA levels through time in a cell, and these would be protein levels translated off of those RNAs, and they fly up and they also fly back down. Why do they fly back down? What happens to the mRNA? It gets degraded, right? And mRNA gets degraded rather quickly. And so, okay, like that makes sense in terms of going up and down, but notice, like, if you look at these numbers, and you look at this, is that a single Poisson process? One process that can be decided, you know, determined by one rate, right? Within a short period of time, 500 buses arrive, and then you wait hours and hours and hours, and then another clump of 30 buses arrive? Like, mm -mm. no, this is not. And it turns out it's not even close. If anything, there's kind of three different Poisson processes. You've got the waiting times between when the promoters are on. That may very well be a single random variable, but you can think of this way. Um, uh, you've got, uh, while it's on, 
in the actual firings of the, the promoter and, and um, the RNA polymerase landing would probably be well described as, as, as Poisson. But then you've also got the time that it stays open and on also varying. Right? This is not a single thing. And so what that means, even though proteins translate more slowly, proteins tend to degrade more slowly, maybe even much more slowly, um, you still, through any single cell, can have quite large variation around kind of the, the typical. And so much of our biological measurements are of the mean that we don't get to see this unless you have some sort of single cell sort of technique. Um, yeah. So this leads then to kind of variation between cells. And this can be seen pretty easily. And it's really importantly, this is variation within the cells. It's not that the cells are necessarily experiencing super different worlds just because of their environment. If their environment was just like constantly changing, bombarded by molecules or little tiny fluctuations in the world, th there was a really cool experiment set up by um, Elowitz uh, some time ago where he put two of the identical promoter in the cell, but one driving red and one driving um, green fluorescent proteins. If their variation through time was due to external forcing, then they should rise and fall together, right? And so every cell should be yellow in terms of kind of, you know, merging of red and green, uh, in terms of fluorescences, um, just the brightness would be different. Okay, fine. If they were independent, they should each have their own fluctuations, and you're gonna get some spectrum of colors. What do you think, given everything I've said, we're gonna see? Who thinks we're gonna see yellow? Who thinks we're gonna see red and green? All right. And again, I apologize if, if color blindness is an issue here. So um, you can see both. We saw both results from the exact same system. Why? This is uninduced. So when the promoter firing is relatively rare, you see this is being different. The sampling noise in a small number of events is enough that you see wide variation. You induce it so there's really strong, and the thing basically stays on. Yeah, there's, there's still statistical fluctuations, but now they're of huge numbers, and it barely matters. And so certainly, it's not to say that every promoter in every system is gonna be super highly noisy. Some things may very well be you know, fairly reasonably steady. Other things are gonna be much, much more fluctuating. Make sense? And so this can play out then. So that's just the events themselves. What if you had feedback upon fluctuations, right? And so we think about gene induction as curves looking like this where this is the lac promoter in E. coli. You can give it something that looks like lactose and the cells will turn on uh, promoter strength. And if you don't uh, give them that, it will stay low. And you can have a nice little kind of titrated curve. You've got your flask and you can add different flasks. You add different levels of IPTG and you can get all these nice levels. So it looks like it's nice and titratable and everything's hunky-dory. If you look at individual cells at that level, that is not what you see. Yeah. The population is halfway on, but it's because half the cells are fully on and the other half are not, right? It's like the difference between having a dimmer switch and all the lights being half brightness versus half of the lights are on one circuit and half on the other circuit. So you can just flip off kind of half of the lights. You'll get the same amount of illumination either way in the room, but they're for totally different reasons, totally different biology in terms of what's going on, right? Um, and so this is what it looks like there. What this is showing, is I think a really cool experiment where they're adding then different levels of an inducer. It's not IPTG, it's a very similar um, thiomethylgalactoside. And what you can see then is the, this bimodal distribution in green fluorescence. But I've got two charts here. Uh, and um, so the interesting thing is, so let me first say actually, why do you get this bimodality? It's because there's positive feedback. I'm not gonna draw through and explain what lag Z and Y and I all do, et cetera. But it's a very simple system if you want to go look at one. And you basically have positive feedback in the following way. The inducer has to get transported by the transporter to be sensed by the regulator. The regulator turns on the system, which leads to making both the enzyme and the transporter, which brings in the regulator. So the more the system's on, the more it can smell what's out there. If you're, you haven't been turned on yet, you're not as sensitive to the outside world. What that means is you can start with cells um, that 
are already on or already are starting off and now expose them to different concentrations and at the exact same middle concentrations, these populations will stay off, those populations will stay on. So even though it's the exact same environment and the exact same genotype. And as you guys are probably familiar with this kind of word, this is an example of hysteresis, right? That there's a, a, a history dependence to the phenotype. And we'll see an example of this phenomenologically later. And it's exactly for that reason. Were you already kicked on or not? Any questions here? All right, so it suddenly leads to you know, kind of a, a bit of a different picture, I think. Um, you know, we, I, I think we fairly, including myself, have been a little bit nonchalant about saying you know, genotype leading to phenotype leading to fitness. And in a population, of course, there could be a cloud of genotypes. There's always going to be some mutations at low frequencies, et cetera, in any you know, strain that you are actually working with. But really, it's a, a cloud of phenotypes at the population and a probability of phenotypes at the level of kind of you know, individual cells, et cetera. And then if they can have history, and that, so suddenly it's, it has the potential to be a bit more complex. Um, and what kicks them on then is these rare bursting events. It can, this is now can be seen using single molecule fluorescence. That here's cells that are on, and here's cells that are off. You can see the difference pretty easily, right? But these cells, if you zoom in on them, they actually have a few little specks of, of, of making new LACY molecules. And so in the rare cells at these intermediate concentrations, they make just enough to cross the threshold that they can begin to bring in the inducer more, and then very, this is time, then they very quickly can transition over, right? So if you have a threshold, that, you know, and, and, and you've got one of these um, systems where if you were to plot out uh, gene expression state and inducer level, the, the steady states would do one of these kind of things where it, it twists over and over a range, you have three steady states, two stables and an unstable in between, right? And so if you pop over that unstable equilibrium, then you get pulled up to a different attractor at that concentration. And that's what happens. Yeah? I'm trying to remember the details for this one. And this is from um, Sunny Shee's lab at Harvard. Uh, I think this was probably, um, no, these were not constitutively expressed, but there was to be a, like a basal level expression. I don't remember kind of like what the level of inducer was to get this. Given this picture, I'm guessing it's, it's one of those moderate concentrations uh, where some of the cells are and aren't, and they're watching kind of what are the, pro how, did, how do cells transition then from one to the other? And they, they, they were actually able to see at a single cell level this little, this little burst, and then that was enough to take, take you off and go. All right, sound good? All right, so let's come back to this question. <laughs> It is, so it is impossible to have you know, a genotype where every cell has an identical phenotype. Right? What would identical phenotype even mean? Right? That would mean like every single protein has exactly the same number you know, in the cell. And every mRNA and the methylation state of the DNA and the number of molecules, and I guess they even have to all have the same phosphorylation states and be aligned exactly this, like this is not going to happen, right? It is, you know, I think the probability of two cells being identical in that way, you know, is less than, uh, you know, the reciprocal of the atoms in the universe or something like that. It, there's so many degrees of freedom that we're talking about there. It's impossible to be identical. And I think we understand, you know, just like you in this room, everyone's special, there's a snowflake. Um, but the question is, is it enough to matter, right? And I'm not going to be here like a, a pan heterogeneicist or whatever, that there's heterogeneity in absolutely everything, throw out everything you've ever done before. You know, uh, the mean is never going to tell us anything. And clearly that's not the case. We've learned a lot. There may be systems where there's some variation in what's going on. You can describe it well, but the mean is reasonable. So, you know, certainly I'm, I don't mean to incite panic. But there are times when the mean is not necessarily a good description of what goes on. We, and we just saw one with the lac operon where you can have these very discrete states. Some that are this and some that are that. And, you know, in eukaryotic biology, this happens all the time. This is why... You know, your brain cells are different than your skin cells, even though they've got the same genome, right? Developmental bi biology, they've gone through a long series of flipping switches in terms of what sort of discreetly different fate they're going to have. There's many different uh, examples with microbes, too. But it doesn't have to be discrete to matter. So imagine there's continuous variation, but over a wide enough scale that it also sets the stage that some of them can survive and some of them can't. Right? And unfortunately, we just don't have as many examples of, of such, but that's where we're going to be heading today. Um, 
Why does this matter from the point of view of selection? So probably the, um, the poster child for this is uh, what's called um, antibiotic persistence. This is not resistance. Resistance is genetically encoded ability to resist an antibiotic because like the site where the antibiotic was going to bind is now a mutation that stops it from being able to bind that pocket. Or you chop up the, enzyme, uh, the antibiotic or you pump it out of the cell and you genetically have that capability. This is purely phenotypic. And this is actually the concept that within a small, um, uh, within growing populations, there can be a small subpopulation that's either non-growing or uh, growing very, very slowly. And this just happens. It's already pre-existing. If you now expose to a lethal stress, the populations will crash out, usually at an exponential rate. But what was found a long time ago, I think, I think it was in the 50s, if I remember correctly, is you had this initial exponential decline falling to a much shallower second exponential decline, which fairly clearly suggested you have one process and now a different process. And what happens is all of the growing cells, antibiotics and other stresses, tend to kill growing cells much more quickly than non-growing cells. And so you kill off everyone who was growing before or growing quickly, and then you're just left with the others. And either they die slowly, or there'll be some rate that they flip back to being a growing cell, and then now they're dead. All right? So, and then as long as they haven't all gone away, you take away the stress, You've got transition probabilities, which are higher back to growing than not, which is why at equilibrium, they're rare, right? Because the frequency is going to be the balance of the two rates, to and fro, if it was just a two-state two process. And then pretty soon, you're back to where you were. And you can repeat this experiment and see it again. So they didn't keep their, like, they do inherit it. And in that those, like, the, you know, the, 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 these cells, you know, are, are what they are. But by the time they start growing, um, like, they lose it again. So this is not kind of a multi-generational. So maybe, like in this case, it's, it's heterogeneity actually without inheritance, because by the time you start to grow again, you've lost the phenotype. Um, yeah, does this make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so in, in the, so persistence is a, is a slightly broad phenotype. Often it's complete non-growth. And the reason, the very reason why you survive antibiotics is because you're not growing. So if you pop out of that state to start growing again and make new, then like both your cell as well as your, the daughter cell are both growers and neither one inherits that persistence state. And so in this case, this would be in, uh, um, heterogeneity without any inheritance. Right? So it saved you temporarily as long as the stress is short, but because there's no inheritance, you go back to, you know, pretty quickly, it, it moves back to the, to the prior distribution. Oh, uh, well, this is a particular type of physiology, and that, that could, so the term bet hedging, right, that it could be an advantage to, you know, put some money on black and some money at red kind of thing, yeah, just in case. So this has the, like, very well could play that role. Now, I don't know that we have any good ex uh, evidence yet that that actually is the reason for persistence. Um, I really enjoyed a review paper by Bruce Levin on this topic, because it was basically echoing almost in my exact words that I was using to describe this. He had a paper um, called the shit happens hypothesis that in a large population, it's not that they want to crash out and stop growing, but shit happens. Why do, why do computers, sometimes, that is the title of the, the paper, and he's a National Academy member, so he can get away with it. But um, like, why do computers crash? Is that a feature? <laughs> you know, like it certainly doesn't seem to be, but some proportion of computers right now are crashed. And if somehow that crashing saved them from who knows what, like it would have, phenomenologically, it would, it would look like bed hedging, but not necessarily that was the reason it was selected for. It's kind of like high mutation rate and stress. I don't know that we actually can say. Now, it doesn't mean that you couldn't then select for it, and plenty of people have done that. And so, yes, this is amenable to selection. Sound good? All right. So I'm not studying antibiotics in this story. Um, but we're going to look at heterogeneity to a toxic molecule and ask, is it there? What about the outcome? Is it kind of black and white that you have a growth and non-growth or death and survival? Or do you get kind of a, a panel of different growth rates between cells? Um, and are like the, the concentrations of the uh, toxins that these uh, that cells, if you do have kind of multiple populations, 
Are they kind of discrete, different populations, or is there kind of a whole continuum of different heterogeneous states, as you'll see? Um, and then, how do these states, these phenotypic states, move? Is there plasticity, which is kind of differential phenotypic response to different environments? Does it matter whether or not, if, if phenotypes do change, does it matter whether you're still in the stress versus you're not in the stress or something in between? Is it inherited? You know, persistence by definition isn't. Like I said, by the time you start growing again, you've lost the phenotype. You know, um, is it inherited and how does that depend upon things? And then we'll, we'll just barely begin to get into, like, so what's actually happening here? So this comes back to the fact that the, the bug that I studied, which I talked about before, can eat things like methanol, it makes formaldehyde as an intermediate. But strangely enough, it's still fairly sensitive to formaldehyde from the outside. And from all the work we were doing on this formaldehyde sensor that interacts with the translation machinery, we realized we don't have any feeling, like, well, how, how fast does formaldehyde kill cells? What's the, the concentration dependence of formaldehyde on death rates and things like that? We just didn't know these sorts of things, and so we thought, let's you know, do some simple experiments there. Um, uh, yeah, and so you know, come back to you know we're, we're talking about the first intermediate that they would normally make, but you know at a continuous and in somewhat uh, lower concentration. And this work um, was just published a few months ago in PLOS Genetics, um, work of Jessica Lee, a fantastic former postdoc, and Sivas Riazi, a graduate student who also finished fairly recently. So there's Jessica. Um, so these cells. You can kill them with formaldehyde, even though they make it as an intermediate. And so this is showing, if you give them another food source, methanol, and then various concentrations of formaldehyde, this is a log scale, you get exponential death. It's faster as you add more, you know, higher levels of formaldehyde. That all seems fairly reasonable. If you take those rates and you plot them, it's linear-ish. You know, fair enough to, to linear. Okay, fine. But what was interesting is if you look at kind of more softer concentrations, that was in just, um, the time scale there was in uh, like three hours, right? And so you can sterilize a culture um, with like 20 millimolar or even 15 or, or 12 and a half in three hours. But if you look back off on the concentration, you get this kind of phenomena where the, these are where there's no formaldehyde at all, that once they get growing, they grow nice and exponentially. At all these other concentrations, by the time they grow, they grow at exactly the same rate. It took a really long time before they did it. A day, two days, more. Yet all the replicates are really just right on top of each other. This doesn't look you know, like some kind of random, lucky process. And so that, that, that kind of got us surprised. Yeah? Did you have a different intuition to begin with? That's a great question. We're going to get to that later, but it's a good intuition. It, it does change, but I'm going to wait till later to tell you when it changes. Only a couple slides, you won't have to hold the thought for too long. So another way you could call this talk is when is a lag not a lag? So it looks like nothing is happening if you look at the level of just how cloudy the media is before it becomes more and more cloudy, which is how we, we make these growth curves. But what if you look at viability? Turns out, if you take, so we're going to mainly talk about this four millimolar scenario here. If you look at viability, for the first 20 hours, there's a three order of magnitude, very consistent exponential decline. And then from tw hour 20 onward, you have an exponential increase. And remarkably, this exponential increase is at exactly the growth rate. Hmm, that seems uh, a little uh, too lucky to be true. And so, how did, you know, what's causing these cells to switch from rapid death to rapid increase? And so we had some hypotheses. One, I think, is where you were going was is that maybe the environment got better, right? They can use formaldehyde as an immediate. Maybe they just made the world better. Maybe there are mutations that confer resistance. We know loci like that uh, regulator that I talked about that could have done that. Perhaps, remember that when we're measuring viable cells here, they have to actually make a colony. Perhaps they're just becoming damaged and then undamaged. I'll get back to that one later. Or maybe there's like, actual just phenotypic differences some of the cells will die and some of them will grow, even though it's the identical world. So the first one, this idea that maybe the, the world just improves. Formaldehyde starts at some level and it drops. There's some threshold level that you can take or not. And as long as you get below that before your, concent uh, your population's all gone, then it can recover. Yeah? There's one genotype. Well, 
remember that one genotype, we grew this, uh, you know, the one genotype were, like, did a density of 10 to the seventh about cells per mil and 10 mils. So it's 10 to the eighth cells. So as you know, in terms of mutations, even when you, like, there's no way, like, you can try to start with one genotype. But it, since you have a, you know, a genomic mutation rate of about uh, 10 to the minus three, we're gonna, like, you do have lots of rare variants in any experiment that you ever do. So that is entirely possible that, that um, there could be rare variants. But yes, it did start with, um, you know, from a clonal, you know, from a colony. It's as best as we can do, yeah, yeah. Um, you have the opposite problem. You don't want to do an N of 10 to the ninth. I'd love to do an N of 100. I would love to do experiments at that size, but it gets hard. So, um, right, so that seems reasonable. We even made a whole model about this, and it all sounds to be fun, no clients, and this and that, et cetera. It turns out the hypothesis that the world was getting better was totally wrong. Well, the world does get better. At about hour 60, it starts to get better not hour 20. This is not change, you know, it effectively is not changing when this important shift is happening. Make sense? So it's not an environmental change. All right, what about genetic? Well, so the first sort of thing you can do is look at uh, heritability. So we could take these cells and retest them. And if you test them, they'll immediately grow up with no lag. All right, I've got new mutants. You can grow them without formaldehyde around and then retest them again, and you go back to the first. So it's heritable, it's not heritable, right? So it's like kind of, like for a little while at least, was heritable. So it's somewhere in the land between. It certainly is not behaving like a normal mutation. But it could be hypergenetic variable, uh, uh, variability. Things like copy number, things, um, there are all sorts of other things that, that, that could be genetic, it could actually be the DNA, but, but certain kinds of events that happen at way higher rates than typical mutation. So um, we sequenced the population kind of at the beginning and also in the middle of this, and there is none of that. There's no copy number variation. There's no anything, nothing in terms of A, G, C, T, da, 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 identical. So there, there's nothing to be seen there at all. Okay, so what's happening? What about being partly dead? So what do I mean by this? Perhaps these cells are simply, they're not completely dead, they're just no longer, have a, they have a lower rate of being able to form a colony. We call it plating efficiency in microbiology. So they're becoming zombies. And then after a while, though the formaldehyde hasn't gone away, um, they're recovering in this ability to form colonies. They've adjusted to what's going on. You know, they've lived at high altitude for a while. They can now deal with this, that sort of thing. And they can, they can make colonies again, and then once, once they all are feeling better, then they grow, right? How would we, then there wouldn't be any demographic turnover. All the cells are still there. They just, they didn't plate out for us and behave as well earlier, you know, during this period of time. So how are we gonna distinguish that from this kind of rare pre-existing phenotype thing? And so there was this really nice, simple assay that Jessica used where you can add a membrane intercalating dye um, and you stain all of the cells. And it doesn't affect their growth, we, we, we showed that too. Um, doesn't affect any of the other distributions we're, we're looking at. And so these cells are gonna be bright. And each time they grow, you'll get two cells that are half as bright. And then four cells that are as quarter as bright, et cetera. It's gonna just nicely dilute out. But what if say a, a lot of the cells don't grow, and only some of the cells can grow. Now what's gonna happen? You're gonna have this large lump, you know, in terms of your, your histogram that's just gonna keep their brightness, and if, especially if this is rare, you're gonna see perhaps multiple generations proceed before you even really detect them as being a reasonable portion of the population. By the time they show up, they're gonna be much less bright. And then they will, you know, kind of continue to become less bright and become more numerous, and you'll, you'll see a kind of a clearly bimodal distribution in the population. Does that make sense? This is what the data look like. So if you add a ton of formaldehyde, this kills them, but the dye is still there. So the dye doesn't react with the formaldehyde and we don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. And if you grow on methanol, but just don't add any, the zero millimolar refers to the formaldehyde concentration, it behaves exactly as it should. This is uh, on a log scale, so as they're exponentially increasing, they're decreasing in a nice consistent way. This is also a log scale in terms of fluorescence. And this is all data from uh, a flow cytometer, a nice fancy little machine that 
um, cells fly by through sheath fluid past a laser that shines on them, and then you can measure all sorts of different things like fluorescences, optical scattering, things like that. And so you can get lots and lots of single events from it. You don't get to resample those cells because they just go you know, through one time, but it's, it's really nice. That's where this data comes from. What does it look like for us? We see this. I don't think you need to run any statistical tests in terms of whether that represents one or two different distributions. It's fairly clear, right? By the time you get out to, like say, 37 hours, you see this little bump. The, most of the original cells don't change their fluorescence at all. They're just there, you know, going on. So the interesting, even though they die, we saw that they die off, they don't pop, and so they're still there as, as, as entities, which is helpful for this. And instead, you just see this rare population come and take over. So, yeah. What, what actually makes them different? I will get to that at the end. Genotypically, there's nothing. Yep, I'll, I'll get to that later. Yeah, and, and I will say already, I do not have a full answer, but we're headed that way. But let me, let me keep going so you, the phenomenon's clear. So, now we can begin to ask a question kind of like the Luria Delbrook, which was lovely to have seen be brought up before. You can imagine kind of two variations of this. Maybe all the cells are weak in terms of their ability to survive formaldehyde, but upon exposure, there's kind of like a race to be able to then become resistant, and some of them make it and some of them don't, but nobody was actually tolerant, you know, kind of at the beginning. Uh, or it might be pre-existing, but you already had some cells that were uh, tolerant. Um, they just were kind of rare in the population. It was something more like persistence. But note, like, um, you know, uh, yeah, so, so we did this experiment, um, exact same thing. We played it onto the, the normal plates where there's no formaldehyde added. So these are, um, you know, uh, permissive to either tolerant or sensitive cells, and that's where you see this dying off and come back up. Or we simply, so Jessica plated them where there already was the stress, the four millimolar um, on the plates, and they have to grow up on the plates with that, and indeed, you have at about 10 to the minus four in the population, already cells who they are tolerant to the stress, even though the rest of them are not. And you can see that after you know, a little bit of a transition, they basically just increase, right? And so they were already there prior to the stress, just like mutations in the Luria Delbrook ex experiment, right? And so in some ways that makes it, oh, this is just like persistence. But remember, persistence is the ability to survive because you aren't doing anything. It's because you are not growing, you survive. These guys are going through generation after generation after generation, increasing from you know, 10 to the two to 10 to the seventh or eighth before the formaldehyde's gone. This is certainly not the same phenotype as that. Does that make sense? So, can we just see this directly? And so, teaming up with um, Andreas Hastecki's lab, at, also at Idaho in physics, where they do a lot of single cell work, looked on little tiny auger pads, you can see these little microcolonies growing up, and so this is methanol with no formaldehyde. Basically every cell makes a little colony, the cells grow at some given uh, rates, et cetera. If you look at methanol with formaldehyde, you can see this one grew. The rest of the cells, they don't do squat. It is actually pretty amazing. Unlike a lot of other stressors, that the cells will like try to grow and then kind of get stuck because they can't divide. Or they might get through a couple divisions and then stop. These cells, like they don't extend by a pixel. The cells, they're not dead yet either. Like this is actually before they're dead. Um, they, they just stop. We think that's actually related to the trans formaldehyde sensing translational interacting machinery that, that we're working on in another part of the lab. It might be why they just some of the cells and the others blow right through that and grow, right? So, there's a very discrete difference, right? It's not like you have a whole range of growth rates. You either basically grew as if the world was fine or not. And you can look at things like the distribution of growth rates, the whole population, if there was no stress versus this subpopulation in the presence of stress, you can see like these are you know, being drawn from the same distribution. Um, and there's a slight increase in the time that it takes for them to start making, uh, to, to start to divide, but even that's relatively subtle. All right, so is this tolerance a discrete or a continuous phenotype? Do you have just a small subpopulation of cells that's totally awesome 
and the rest are all equally losers? Or do you have some you know, wide range of things? Because when it comes to persistence, you have two groups. You're a persister, you're not a persister, which is why you have such a clean one exponential decline, another exponential decline. You had two clear categories, um, so, right? So it doesn't look like that. Or is it something more like this, where you've got kind of a wider spread, and depending upon how much formaldehyde you add, where you'll be hitting the, the, the spread of things. So for this, Jessica turned really simply to plate on a whole you know, a set of concentrations. And so we, before we're only looking at, at concentration four, let's do everything you know, zero to 10. Da, 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 da. It's a lot of work, because you don't know how many are gonna grow, so you have to try lots of different dilutions so, to get something that's countable. But anyways, she did it, and the data are pretty cool. So imagine it was discrete. One in a 1,000 are awesome, they can take five, and anything below that. And the rest can only go up to, say, two. These data are inherently gonna be cumulative, because if you can survive five, you're gonna be on every other plate below that, right? And so then you get two steps. You get tick, tick, and then nothing. And that would represent two kind of you know, spectra of, of actual phenotypes. Most of them are twos, and a little bit that are fives. Make sense? These are the data. The data is we observe a continuum. Even at two millimolar, not all the cells make it. Most do. Well, not even most. It's about half, um, but quite a few. And then you know, one in a thousand survive three. One in ten thousand four. One in a million five. And, and at least with this set, we don't see anything higher. There's a continuum. And you can see, like, interestingly, it looks about exponential-ish once it starts to fall down. Yeah. These are all, yeah. Ah, so there's two. It's not colony size either. And so, so this is a very important point, is that the phenotype ends up becoming growth or no growth at all. But the threshold for what concentration pushes you one way or the other is continuous. Does that make sense? So like you will either make it or not. But, uh, there, but if we were to describe, you know, if we were to dial up you know, the heat in the room, it's not like you know, everyone crashes all at once and then just like two survive later. That there's all sorts of kind of different ranges that cells can make it. So the threshold is continuous. The outcome is discrete. This is, these, are, these, um, these are the cells that are able to grow in the presence of that stress. These are the live, the growing cells are the ones that we're, we're saying that are phenotypically tolerant. Yeah, does that make sense? But that's a really, really important point, right? And, and it's, it's important subtlety, because like I said, it, this does behave somewhat continuous in terms of threshold, but then the outcome is discrete. We haven't seen any scenario where the outcome is just a variety, a wide variety of growth rates, for example, which you do get with some, say, antibiotics. All right. Well, why? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get, I haven't quite shown you enough maybe to fully believe the Lamarckian aspect. So far, we've just got heterogeneity. I haven't shown you inheritance, right? Because inheritance is the other critical part of a Lamarckian sort of hypothesis. Oh, that's what I was trying to say. It's exactly like a Luria Delbrook. Yeah, but it's not a genotype. Yes. Right. But it could be, I don't know that I would use the word, like, to some extent, I would say persistence, sensu stricto, is not really Lamarckian because it's not an inherited phenotype. So you survive because you were lucky, but you don't get to pass it on to your children. By the time you have children, they're not a persister. So as you'll see, this is gonna be a bit different. All right, so you, know, you, you could maybe try to hand wave, well, you know, it kind of has to look like this, and that makes sense for whatever reason you might think that it does. It can look different, and so, what I'm showing you so far is in gray. These are cells that were grown up on methanol. They were sitting in stationary phase for a period of time before we tested them. The yellow represents methanol cells that were in the middle of growth. And unlike actually most stressors, growing cells are actually more tolerant than non-growing cells, which is actually, like I said, kind of surprising. Antibiotics typically are, and other things typically are flipped the other way around. Those were cells that were grown up on, on methanol. These, in pink, were cells that were grown up on succinate compound that doesn't have formaldehyde as an intermediate, 
you still have a distribution. You still have like some fours in there, but you can see it's orders of magnitude less. So it's a, it's a much weaker distribution, but you still have a distribution. So it definitely depends upon what it is that you were growing on. Are you still growing or, or stationary phase? The dark red, those are the cells at the end of that experiment. After whatever made it through to the end in the four millimolar, they were only challenged with four, but now like almost all the cells are sixes and sevens, and you can see eights and nines. Like, you have cells that are remarkably tolerant. Like I said, these are concentrations that would have sterilized the culture in, in a short period of time before, and now they're growing in the presence of it. Not just surviving it, but growing in the presence of it. So it is definitely something that can you know, squeeze in and out, in, it, depending upon environment, and it's a continuous phenotype. It's not just kind of two discrete groups, all right? Now that we know this, we can go back to the dynamic experiment and watch the change in the distribution. If we start with this initial distribution, how's that distribution gonna change? And then ultimately, I'm gonna talk about what are we gonna, what are we gonna try to learn phenomenologically and then later mechanistically. Um, so if we look, we're gonna zoom in on kind of this first 20 hours in terms of when kind of all this funky stuff is happening from growing and dying populations to, to, to not. If you take this kind of cumulative distribution of data and sub subtract kind of what you saw at each concentration, you get kind of those that were uniquely fives, uniquely fours, uniquely threes, et cetera. You get kind of the actual kind of, uh, you know, it's like a CDF versus PDF sort of uh, uh, change. You get, you know, kind of what the distribution looks like if we now look at it through time. And so it, it, initially there's just zero up through fours. You see several things. These low tolerance, and this is a log, mini log, <laughs> Uh, scale uh, here, those low tolerance categories certainly decline, but don't go away. The high tolerance categories increase and, and even show up in bins that weren't filled before at all. There were no fives, sixes, sevens, eights, and they're showing up. And, and like I said, this is a uh, you know, six or seven orders of magnitude shown here. This population is actually strongly bimodal at time 16. Time 16 is when the population is basically half of the cells that are not tolerant, the last ones to die off, and the tolerant ones have just grown up to be numerous enough that they, they represent about equal proportions, and interestingly, the distribution is very bimodal. There are many more like zeros and fours, and, you're, and it's relatively depauperate in ones, twos, threes, and then again in, in kind of higher categories, relatively. I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it's continuous, it's not, they're not absent, but it, it is pretty highly bimodal. So I'm going to plot this differently so that it, it's easier to see this, where time is just going to be represented by these colors, red through blue, where you've got this initial distribution going through this light blue bimodal uh, distribution to kind of what it looks like uh, later, okay? So this is what the data is going to look like uh, going forward. Yeah? We have, I, that is a lovely experiment. We have not done that experiment. Uh, I mean, kind of. I mean, that's what I showed you in that, di that one. Some of the cells are, right? That those that survive four, some of them actually can, can take eight. After that, that. Yes, yes. They, this, this distribution is clearly keeps moving up. Because this is, this is the distribution only up to hour 20. It was hour like 80 when the distribution of tolerances is, is re, was really, here, was really strong. This would have been like hour 80 or something like that. So it does actually keep kind of pulling out that way. So it's a, it's a, it can be a little bit hard to see because it's a log scale. Like you might, sorry, looking all over the place. There might actually be some cells in these categories um, they're just kind of hard to see. And in fact, when you subtract, when you look at the data there, there are some cells that remain down there. Um, you, know, you, you still see cells in these bins even, even somewhat later. So what forces are going on here? Like just from a phenomenological perspective, this is kind of gonna sound similar to the, um, the stuff that um, Vaishali was talking about in terms of, let's imagine there were, you know, um, uh, rates and sizes of mutations, and it's a you know it's a somewhat approximate way of viewing what's there. But let's just let's see what 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 can we possibly glean phenomenologically while we're waiting to figure out what the hell is going on because we don't have a, a full and clean answer to that. Though I will get to that later. For example, 
can I just have a death and birth process and get these data? Or do you have to have movement in phenotype space going on at the same time to explain it? Right? So that's one thing. And how does death appear to depend upon formaldehyde outside and your tolerance level? I'll talk about that. Is there any evidence for inheritance or for plasticity that you see movement and that movement, for example, depends upon what the environment looks like? Can you possibly pass on to your children what it is that you are? Uh, to some extent, like this, no change in phenotype would mean perfect inheritance, right? That's testing. Could there be, you know, like cells stay exactly in the bins that they are and don't change at all, right? And so that would represent kind of the other extreme. So here's the conceptual model. This was work that Siavash uh, uh, worked on. So we, we're going to back. Up. So we're going to uh, consider the formaldehyde tolerance level. Uh, this trait X. This is going to be our continuous trait in what will end up becoming a PDE. It's it's not time. It's it's uh, it's you know, it's, to it's not space. It's tolerance level is the phenotype we're considering. And we're going to have growth rate R time T. We're going to have a um, our uh, death function H. I'll show you two hypotheses and actually a, a kind of a spectrum of hypotheses that are tested for what death might look like uh, given the formaldehyde concentration. And then we imagine just two really phenomenological processes that you guys are probably comfortable with and usually biologists feel much less comfortable with. Um, one would just be a diffusive process. This would be like you know, inheritance of uh, you know, molecules each time the cell divides. When it divides, you know, one could get a little bit more, one could get a bit less, etc. You could end up imagining kind of like a you know, a spreading process through time, and that would go in both directions, et cetera, right? Or advection, right? And advection, you know, this is kind of you know, a, a strong statement. This is saying that kind of every tolerance category in either the upward or the downward direction, whatever the sign of this ends up being called out, linear through time, and every bin of tolerances just sliding down as if they were like little, little you know, boats on a river, right? So th those are two very simplistic models, right? Spread, boats on a river. Like that's, that's all we're thinking about so far because, like I said, we don't have you know, uh, more sophisticated knowledge of, of mechanism. So mathematically then, thankfully, during this key uh, transition, growth rate does not appear to be a function of tolerance level. The tolerant cells grow as just as fast as normal cells. And so we just have one growth rate, which we, like, we have plenty of data to fit that from you know, outside of this experiment. And so we know what the growth rate is. Death, I'm going to get back to that in just a minute. Um, we have, we have uh, kind of a couple hypotheses there, what that could look like. And then spreading of tolerance, either a diffusion term or an advection term. All right, so fairly simple. Now, why am I, you know, what's interesting about death here? You can imagine kind of two extremes. Uh, you can imagine a lot of things, but here are the two extremes that, we're, that we looked at. One is that there's an absolute threshold. If the concentration like you put in three millimolar, if you're a 3.1, you're fine. If you're a 2.9, you're dead. And if you're a 2.9, you're just as dead as if you were a 0.1. So I think of this as like a, uh, a linear cheetah gazelle model. If you had a cheetah and a gazelle run down a, a, a hallway, if the gazelle is faster than the cheetah, it doesn't matter by how much, it'll survive. If it's slower than the cheetah, it doesn't matter by how much, it's dead. Right? And you, if you have some sort of threshold behavior, like it can, sometimes can be just, you know, which side of that line are you? Right? So that would be kind of one extreme. Now we know, though, if you increase the formaldehyde, the death rate's faster. We saw that from before. And it means, of course, then the tolerance level, by definition, moves up in terms of who's going to make it or not. So that's, this is what death would look like if, if it was absolute. On the other hand, things could get gradually worse. You could put all sorts of different functions here. Let's just imagine it gets linear worse after uh, that point. Um, and so that would mean, you know, if, if you were a 2.9 and the world was 3, you just die a little bit. And your death rate actually might be less than your growth rates. You might just grow slower, right? And then things get worse as you have lower tolerance, and it would slide up like that. The important thing is those will change the distribution differently, as so I'm sure you can see. If this is the log, this, this should say log, log of the CFU, we have initially this exponential-ish shape if it's just completely, and, and this is just uh, um, growth and death, if it's an absolute transition, then everybody ahead of that line is going to grow exponentially at the same rate, 
everyone to the other side is going to die at the same rate. And note that this will create a bimodal distribution as these two, you know, like tectonic plates are just moving one up and one down. If it's gradual, so that you even have some point where birth equals death, that tolerance uh, level is going to stay where it is. These just grow more slowly. These pull down. And it's going to turn this kind of in a nice gradual way um, to a unimodal situation, right? So there's something to be said about how the data look in terms of kind of where this is. And of course, maybe it's not strictly one. Maybe it's not strictly the other. You could try an infinite number of different functions. We decided to simply put in one term, b, where 0 represents the absolute, 1 represents the, the uh, relative, and maybe you know, it's somewhere in between. It could be a partly threshold, but also partly uh, matters how far back you are. Does that make sense? And like I said, you could, you could do all sorts of things, but the, you know, our, we didn't want to, you know, the goal here was not to try 37 different functions and see which one we like better, but just, you know, like where in this kind of spectrum do, do things seem to be. So. I'll first say what we saw, and then I'll say a little bit more about how we got there. So these are experimental data that you already saw. Here are our model data. Um, we, not surprisingly, use a likelihood um, ratio test on kind of like nested models, as you'll see in just a second, kind of building in different pieces. I would say overall, it captures the growth and death dynamics pretty well, despite how really simplistic these functions are. You know, pseudo R squared is really pretty reasonable. You see this bimodality in the the intermediate transition that looks, you know, at least you know, fairly reasonable compared to what the data were. So how did we move in that direction? We took this initial discrete distribution, right? We have measurements at zero, one, two, three, four. There's measurement noise. We have to consider things about like, well, what's our limit of detection? Maybe there were some fives, but we just couldn't see them. And what's the, the best case scenario? Like, what's the most conservative we could be? Throw that in too. Need to transform things so that we don't have zeros. Um, got, you know, chopped it up into, you know, um, you know, by the time this gets solved, I think it's like 10,001 discrete bins, or maybe it was 1,001, I can't remember, um, you know, in terms of the PDE solving. Um, like I said, the growth rate was fit independently, and then we're going to try to estimate the other parameters here, the D, the V, and then both the alpha and the beta using maximum likelihood, and then we're going to, you know, like I said, um, run uh, uh, nested models moving forward with adding terms if there's support and if it was the best model. And so we started with just growth and death, fit parameters, see how well that it does, right? Uh, and so then you, you, you get one parameter, and we're not yet, don't have any of the other processes. And then we add in each of the other processes individually. Do, is there support for any of them? Yes, there are. Which one's the best? The one that was the best was adding da, 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 uh, diffusion. OK, and now stacked on top of that, is it worth adding in advection or um, a uh, kind of uh, Somewhere between, you know, uh, uh, somewhere between being an absolute versus a, a relative death model. And there was support for this kind of um, a relative death model, et cetera. And then there was no more support for adding advection by the time we'd done all those things, right? So what does this mean biologically? I think you know, a couple things. Death appears to be kind of somewhere between these two extremes. It matters a bit what your tolerance is if you can't keep up with the formaldehyde, but it also, there is a a thresholdness to what seems to be going on also, which is why you get this bimodality. But there's some, you know, it definitely matters whether or not you can keep up uh, exactly with the concentration out there. And probably most importantly is there's very clear evidence you must have phenotypic change during the time course of this experiment to explain the data. And given the options, we only gave diffusion and advection as options, there, it's a saying like there is spreading in both directions. You see both phenotypes moving lower and higher. And by the time you have that, there doesn't seem to be, you know, there wasn't support to have kind of both a diffusion and infection at the same time. So what does this mean kind of in picture? We have this initial distribution. We have rare cells that are really tolerant, a lot of cells that are lower tolerance. It's about exponential. You hit stress that, you know, cleaves off. Only the, the top kind of can survive. Those die. Those grow. But there's also kind of diffusion amongst these, these groups that are going on while this happens, which means even as the population begins to become more and more high tolerance, they're still generating low tolerance types, and they're continuing to move out this way, right? And so we continue to see cells, like those should have died off. Given the rate of death that you see early on, by 20 hours, it should have been basically cleaned up in the zero ones and twos and threes. They're still being generated, right? And if you have phenotypic movement in both directions, 
right? This is basically you know, like a, a phenotype selection balance type of regime where you're gonna just keep making some cells that aren't able to keep up. You'll detect them, but they're, they're on their way to dying off. Oh, so no, I certainly, no, there's definitely, like the way I was, um, this would be over the course of, of many, I, I, I didn't have the mountains grow at the same time. I was just looking kind of at the proportions of who's in what category. There's absolutely growth going on. Do any of those grow at all? Um, I mean, in principle, all categories grow, but those categories, the death rate is higher than their growth rate. So they have a net death rate. There is. The growth rate term happens to all all, all categories. Yeah. Well, I mean, what we don't have, what we'd like to have, of course, is much more granular data. Let's look at individual cells or other sorts of ways to actually follow these transitions through states. And, I, and if time allows, and I think it will, I, I'll, I'll get to that aspect. Yeah. So one way of looking at this, an entire paper and a slide or an attempt at that, um, we started with kind of these different tolerance distributions if you were to look at either succinate or methanol. And we're gonna just take the meth and the formaldehyde with no formaldehyde around. If you now take the methanol one, put it in growth with the stress, methanol plus formaldehyde, most of the cells are below the ability to make it and they're gonna die. So they're gonna kinda of get squeezed in. But those at the top can grow and fan out, but you're also gonna have phenotypic movement in, in various directions that will also help populate kind of the bubble up above. And so through time, this experiment, you end up with a distribution that's actually, a lot of them are much more tolerant than even the stress was. Um, I guess the orange should go down in the late time, but I'm trying to keep it somewhat simple. But you still make some of these weaklings uh, down at the end. Oh, I haven't shown you the second part. Uh -huh. Sorry, I put that slide a little too early. Um, there was a hint there where we're going. Um, and, and just to get a little artsy fartsy for a second, right? We were talking about, you know, Rare colonies growing, that's kind of what, what some of our data look like. This image of uh, you know, inheriting the, the stretching of your parents or the neck you know, uh, going down the generations. So working with uh, an artist at um, iBest, we came up with kind of a little cover image of our little micro colony growing into the shape of a giraffe reaching up for, for the leaves. Yeah, a little Lamarck on his desk kind of thing. So I just like it, so I had to throw it in here. So, but I already gave you a hint if you were paying close attention. What happens when you take the formaldehyde away? I said early on that they don't get to completely keep it, at least not the way that we did that experiment. So, you know, these cells represent what happens out here. Like, presumably it's gonna go back to, you know, settle back to the old distributions. And we can ask things about, like, how fast is it lost? Is it gonna go away in five minutes, in a half an hour? Does it take an entire transfer or more, et cetera, for it to happen? Does that rate in the, uh, depend upon the environment? And what does it look like is the, is the, as you pop the balloon? Is this, is this uh, distribution settles back down? What shape does that have, right? You can imagine all sorts of types of phenomena. So here's in growth in succinate. So succinate is a four carbon organic acid that, has, that doesn't involve formaldehyde as an intermediate. Your initial distribution here is in dark red. And as they grow, you can see in a fairly consistent manner they're, they're losing their tolerance and beginning to look closer to exponential. The original curve would have been about right here. So they're not, after 24 hours, this is after six doublings, they haven't yet gotten back to their old tolerance, but they've almost gotten back to their old shape of an exponential distribution. So it is slowly and gently lost. It is not like the lights get turned on and off in the room. And all categories seem to be changing relatively similarly. Huh. What about on methanol? The original experiment started with methanol-grown cells, and you saw this, this exponential distribution that's you know, fairly weak. I certainly would have thought maybe it would take more time, but it'll settle back down. It doesn't. This is the original distribution. This is the distribution after 24 hours of growth with no external formaldehyde. They keep the tolerance. And so this is an example of hysteresis. Because they've been kicked in the head before by formaldehyde, 
Now when they grow on methanol, which makes a bit of formaldehyde inside the cells, they keep these amazingly high tolerance levels, the lethal levels of stress, almost completely inherited. I mean, we just, we just could not believe that it looks like this. Um, and like I said, I cannot wait to be able to answer my Charlie's questions, and at least I can go in that direction in terms of what is going on here. If you, by, you, know, you plug this into a model, and uh, the model data are now, uh, or the model results are now shown, you can model this as um, advection, uh, or sorry, for the, the methanol results, there's basically almost nothing going on, it's mainly growth. There's just a very, very weak advection term. It's, they're getting a little bit weaker, but very, very slightly. Succinate, you can just put in a pretty strong advection term, and it fits, the, it's amazing, the R, like the pseudo R squared was like 0.99. So it's like such a stupid model, like every tolerance category would somehow just move linearly down in formaldehyde tolerance space through all of time, all of 24 hours, that that would work, I think is remarkable. What could that be? I mean, that could be like dilution of protein factors, the idea that like maybe there's, you, know, you have some level of something, and that each time you grow, it's kind of just getting diluted down uh, each time, but then somehow getting cut in half each time would have to linearly change your formaldehyde tolerance. Like, I, it's really surprising that the math ended up looking so simple, that just advection um, would describe this. But there it seems to be this, this gentle dilution of what's going on. Does that make sense? Yeah. We're getting there. Yeah, I do. Um, so right now, essentially, what the hell is X, right? Like what, is, like what causes this tolerance? Um, is it differential expression of key proteins? We already heard one hypothesis, which is great. I don't have to introduce it. Perhaps it's different formaldehyde tolerance. Some cells just have more formaldehyde oxidation genes. Some don't. They're, the only paper that's close to this that I've seen is a wonderful paper from Terry Ruwa's lab at San Diego, Daris et al., where they saw a somewhat similar behavior to this with chloramphenicol resistance. It was plus minus growth, continuum of survival, et cetera. And for them, it was. They could explain their model and manipulate all around it that it was the level of chloramphenicol resistance because there's positive feedback. The more resistant you are, the more you can keep chloramphenicol low, which means you can keep growing well, which means you have a higher level of expression of the chloramphenicol resistance gene. So because there's kind of an inherent positive feedback, da da da, you get, yeah. So we thought that that would be a very good hypothesis too. And maybe that, that plays a role. Could, maybe a, a reason why you might have differential expression, could it be something epigenetic? Microbes do have this. We just have only recently had a way of being able to assess this. Maybe it's DNA methylation, a methylated cytosine, a methylated, et cetera. Post-translational modification of proteins, maybe it's a phosphorylation state of something, who knows. Differential inheritance of things. There's been some neat um, work in this kind of direction with some, a, a variety of things, including protein aggregates, et cetera. Okay. And then like what functions, like Deepa was asking. Like certainly formaldehyde oxidation seems like the obvious candidate for something to be going on here. So where are we? So Janelle Bizzardo, another former postdoc who's now at the University of Minnesota, um, with her own lab, um, she did a simple RNA-seq experiment. Now RNA-seq is a bulk measure. You have to grow up a flask and take all that RNA, and another flask take all that RNA. Um, and so, but we could at least look at how is a distribution that's tilted pretty high compared to a distribution that's tilted pretty low in tolerance, how do they compare? At least what's the, is there some like typical differences in expression between those, even if we don't have single cell measures yet? Make sense? Because we need to know something to go looking at in single cells. We need a hypothesis to, to move forward to single cell work. And so what we did is we compared wild type growing on methanol with no stress, so it has a fairly weak distribution of tolerance, but it's happy versus the tolerant cells in the presence of four millimolar formaldehyde still, but they're also growing at, at, at exponential rates. And I was really worried that, all right, fine, they're, they're growing okay, but they're stressed, and like, we're gonna see tons of differences. The, you know, the typical thing, when you do these kind of work, you've got a couple conditions, you hope to find something, and you do. You find like a thousand somethings, and then you don't know what to do, and you're sorry you ever did the experiment, because um, you don't know <laughs> what to do next. And so I definitely thought we'd see a lot. And surprisingly, very surprising, I think. There were 23 genes with statistically significant and substantial differences in expression. Um, and they were only in six gene clusters. The tolerant cells in the presence of lethal stress mainly 
have a transcriptional program that just looks normal, which is weird. There are some that um, are, you know, are, are quite different. This is on a log two fold chain. So a number of things are in the you know, three to four fold increase. Okay, well maybe it's just kind of stress response. So there's very commonly a set of genes that get turned on when you take a happy population and you whack them with something and they freak out. And, and so maybe it's just stress response. That's actually the x-axis. If you take the wild type cells, hit them with formaldehyde and get their RNA before they start to die. So we thought that this might be just like some subset of what the cells do when they freak out. Where would the data be if they were the same, if this was a subset? They'd be here. They'd either be genes that were turned on in both situations or turned off in both situations. These data are actually in this quadrant. These are genes that are actually, if anything, turned down during stress response, but they're up in the tolerant cells. This is not just normal stress response. This is, it, like, this is its own unique and, and somewhat circumscribed response, which I think is pretty cool. All right, but then what, what are the damn genes? You know, I'd love to say, you know, like, you know, uh, you know, like in a game show, all right, show me the results, and it'd be just C1 gene, C1 gene, C1 gene, C1 gene, and that would be great. As you can imagine, <laughs> by my tone, that's not what we saw. I'm sure you can all read this perfectly well, and you've already taken in all the information, so I can move to the next slide, right? Okay. So, I know you don't know a single name of a C1 gene, but, uh, and Deepa knows a fair number of them, whether or not she can see this, but I'll tell you the answer. There are none, none of the C1 genes. And even when you look at them specifically, they didn't, there, there was not even a, a small significant response of any of them, at least on, you know, on average, because it's an RNA-seq experiment. What, you know, what the, what, there are a number of things that are seen. One category pops up a fair amount. Um, there's actually another one too, um, electron transport chain, but. A lot of genes, USPA and HSP20. Supreet, tell me what type of stress this is. Eat, or, which causes what to the cell? Protein aggregation, right? This is probably similar to what we heard before. That formaldehyde damages proteins. It seems to be that the genes that show the biggest response, or at least a category that's highly enriched, are dealing with the problem rather than just stopping the problem from occurring in the first place. Um, and so, you know, what I think we have here then is you know, selection. So what do you need to call something evolution, right? You need variation, you need selection, and you need inheritance, right? You can't, you know, without the inheritance, like I, I wouldn't call the persistence, like it's survival, but there's no inheritance component here. Here we've got selection, right? Some are growing and some are dying. It happens to be a continuous phenotype. But in this case, there is a heritability. And that, that, that degree of heritability is not perfect in the way mutations often are, but it can be quite long. Like I said, in, in, you know, with, given the hysteresis, they grew out another six or seven generations and there's almost no change in the tolerance distribution. But that certainly it's plastic. It depends upon what the world is. And what I want to make sure that it's clear, though, and, and where I'll, I have time to end with, is this is not to say there isn't a role for you know, our, our patron saint in this picture, right? The ability to have phenotypic heterogeneity, to have inheritance, et cetera, is genetically encoded, right? Everything the cell does comes ultimately from the genotype. And so I think of it like you can have plans that would tell a manufacturer how to make dice. Right, that's the genotype. But then you've got the roles, and you know that can be phenotypic, right? And so, you know, you can have a probabilistic outcome that's perfectly well encoded, but the it doesn't encode the, the precise outcome, it encodes the probabilities of what can happen. The difference here is because of the inheritance, it means if you roll a 12, then you're pretty likely to roll a 12 or maybe an 11 or a 10 the next time around. That makes it different, right? You're not just redrawing from the probability, it's conditioned somehow, and, and sometimes fairly strongly, upon where you were before. And so I'm really interested in this, like how then, how would evolution see this kind of picture? Um, let me say one more thing in terms of evolution uh, before I launch into kind of where we're going with the work. So I've shown you this gray organism, Methylobacterium extorkins. These are all other Methylobacterium in pink lines in terms of their tolerance distributions, and these are non-Methylobacterium. You might have heard of this one, and Pseudomonas pudida, for example, is another model system. Um, there is tremendous variability 
amongst natural isolates. And so certainly, you know, one question that we'd like to go is to ask, like, how much does this formaldehyde tolerance matter in nature? How pliable is it? It's clearly pliable. You have some that are really weak. You have some that are really strong. But look at the shapes of the distributions. Some actually do have a plateau in the data, which means a continuous distribution down to some point, and then some absolute rock stars, right? And kind of a gap in between. And so even like the, the shape of the distribution is clearly quite different from each other. I think that's cool. Um, for E. coli and Pseudomonas, formaldehyde isn't a part of their daily world. They're not methylotrophs. However, what were the genes we, you know, at least amongst the genes we saw, <laughs> Uh, they, they have differential expression, which is not to say expression is the only thing that could matter. There could be all sorts of other phenotypes, but that's the only one that we've got a handle on yet. If things like dealing with protein damage are the cause, well, E. coli and pseudomonas, they also have to deal with protein damage. It just might be due to things like salt or organic acids or heat or things like that, right? And so it makes us wonder whether, you know, like the fact that we, we see a tolerance distribution certainly scales differently, but this is growth, not just survival, but growth in the presence of formaldehyde while they're eating something else that they like, like glucose. And so there may even be somewhat similar causes for such things across other organisms with formaldehyde as a stress, or another direction is if you hit with somewhat similar stresses, like heat, salt, ethanol, um, you know, et cetera, things that, that can cause uh, protein misfolding, perhaps the same lucky cells that could survive formaldehyde could also survive them, that you'd actually have pleiotropy which I'll get, I'll get to in tomorrow's lecture, at a phenotypic level, um, you know, so that the same lucky phenotype may be. And we know that, there we know that you can have pleiotropy at the single cell level. I already told you an example. Persistence. Two traits, growth and survival. In this case, they're anti-correlated. You either grow and die, or you survive, but you're not growing. That's pleiotropy. There could easily be pleiotropy here between kind of different stresses that, that are being survived. All right, so where do we want to go? How might this affect the evolution? Um, we'll, one interesting thing is, um, you know, you know, how, you know, if, if you can phenotypically behave almost like a new beneficial mutation because you have a new phenotype and it's partly inherited, et cetera, is this going to end up, um, you know, just simply playing this role of kind of letting cells survive long enough and buying time so that genetic changes can happen later? That's kind of a very common way that people phrase how phenotypic heterogeneity could be useful for a population. Will these phenotypic mutants, these phenomutants, will they compete with genetic mutants so that they'll basically clonally interfere with new mutations and kind of tamp down adaptation? Or might you have scenarios where the genetic mutation, its phenotype actually depends upon the epigenetic phenotype of the cell that arises in it? And we have some soft examples, certainly, and there are some other interesting ones that are beginning to accumulate in the literature, that just because you introduce a given genotype into a given lineage, you don't always see the same phenotype, which is a really, it feels like a pretty big rule breaker. But like, there's more and more evidence for such things being possible. So it'd be like epistasis between the mutation and the epigenetic state. We have mutations that showed up in evolution experiments that when reintroduced into the ancestor have no damn effect. Perhaps it needed to have been a tolerant cell, and whatever that means, to have been beneficial and rise in frequency. And when we just throw it into kind of a normal physiology cell, it doesn't. Whoa, this is just, like, that would be, that would be a pretty different scenario uh, to think of. Um, you know, and, and like I said, you know, how do these, uh, you know, the relative importance of phenotypic and genotypic processes depend upon population size? You know, one neat thing about these phenotypic distributions is even though high tolerance was rare, it wasn't that rare, it was 10 to the minus 4. You know, um, and there was like survival at 3 was 10 to the minus 3, et cetera. So even a population of 1,000 might be lucky enough to have a phenomutant that can survive a lethal stress when its chance of getting a mutation at only 10 to the 3 to survive can be pretty low, right? And so that having kind of a, a, a quasi species of phenotypes may be very important, especially at small population sizes. So what would, what would we really like to know, right, so that we could do a, a better model and have a better understanding? Besides knowing the mechanism, I'd want to know things like this. As the tolerance distribution goes from something that looks like this to something that looks like this, what are the transitions that are possible, right? What does this look like? 
how much do the arrows like tilt upward in, in, you know, in a plastic response due to stress? How much, um, you know, if all the lines were just parallel, then you have perfect inheritance. If they're all were just kind of re, you know, going everywhere with equal probability, you'd have no inheritance. Like, what does this look like? How does it depend upon the genotype upon the environment? Um, and we have a way, I'm happy to talk about it later. We think we can use neutral barcodes and do a, phenot do a phenotypic version of the luria delbruck experiment where we let the, a neutral genetic barcode just be like a little marker that distinguishes the progeny of individual cells, grow them out for a period of time, separate them, and then expose them to stress, and basically ask, do we collect the same markers multiple times when we phenotypically test them, even though that marker came from the great, 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 great grandfather cell, grandmother cell, sorry, bacteria, it's, it's always uh, <laughs> mother cells and daughter cells, you know, grand, great, grandmother cell, you know, generations back. And then we can even test multiple stresses and ask whether you have correlations between stresses. We could run it from multiple generation times out and ask what's the time scale for this inheritance to break down. Um, we certainly want to you know, directly observe uh, this work, and, and we'll be doing this with um, Andreas Vastekis. Uh, and um, we can certainly do more interesting experiments between um, thinness and tolerance, play the kind of games that were um, 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 mentioned earlier in terms of what if you expose to some formaldehyde first and then expose to more later and these sorts of cool games that could be done. Um, and, and I mentioned very briefly that we've had some interesting things where um, uh, from our previous evolution that don't, don't quite make total sense where genotypes either can't be fully recapitulated or we get cells that could grow at a high level, we go to retest them and they can't unless we kind of march them back up. And we think, that, so like, it may be that, that cells kind of, during the actual adaptation, they, they, they were on kind of the extremes of their own phenotypic distribution to have ever even made it in the world because of the, the selection going on. Um, yeah, so like kind of this idea of where they kind of surfing along the top of their own phenotypic distribution, and thus they would have to be actually the backgrounds for the new mutations to occur in to, to rise further because they're the only ones that can make it. Because uh, we've seen yeah, weird things that just kind of don't uh, tend to add up. Um, and, and this I already mentioned actually also about mutations that we've seen that then later have no effect and so maybe it actually depended upon the phenotype they arose in. Um, and we have other populations that can never be resuscitated, yet another problem. Evolve them forward, they're perfectly alive, you put them in the freezer, you bring them back out, they won't grow. Which is, and, and so certainly something about their phenotypic state is more problematic than usual. But so this is the kind of picture I think that we're thinking of now. I've talked about this step. You start with a weak distribution, and through purely Lamarckian phenotypic processes, as you crank up the stress, you get something like this. But then, of course, in this background, you might have you know, a new mutation that allows now some other distribution so that when the stress cranks up, maybe it has the ability to, to rise to yet some higher level, and then, you know, et cetera. And that, you, you know, that, that, that there could be an, an important place, an important interplay between what's possible through phenotypic processes and what's going on from genotypic. And so we really want to look at this kind of entanglement of Darwinian and Lamarckian dynamics. Um, but it gets hard. <laughs> I wish it was an easy question. I seem to never go for easy questions. Um, but, uh, the, you know, I, but I think it's really important. Um, and so, yeah, we want to you know, try to connect tolerance to evolution and ultimately you make a, you know, a, a more comprehensive, you know, better than just advection diffusion sort of model that we can ultimately use as a way to interpret the growth data and things and survival data that I've shown you here, but also like the barcoding types of data, et cetera, so that we have kind of a, you know, a synthetic picture. And this is work that um, collaborating, besides Andreas Vestecki, is also uh, collaborating with Jeremy Draghi, who's now at Virginia Tech, who's a fantastic um, computational biologist. And so, this involved a number of people at University of Idaho, um, which has been a, a wonderful place to work at, Jessica Lee, um, and thankfully some of the different funding sources have some relationship with heterogeneity. We were able to squeeze in being able to, to, to make this work happen. Uh, and I'll, this is my one chance to show up my, my pretty kind of end and, and take questions slide and show you this is what Idaho looks like at various times of the year, sometimes like that, sometimes like that. Um, yeah, happy to take questions.